Hi, welcome to Coffee and Closers. I'm Michael Abador, and I want to personally invite you to join me and one of today's top performing sales stars for a cup of coffee and authentic conversation. And our collective goal is that you will walk away with tangible knowledge that you can apply to your sales efforts today. Are you ready? We'll grab a cup, fill it up, and let's get into another episode of Coffee and Closers. Welcome to Coffee and Closers. Put your hands together for taking time away from your desk to learn something. How many people, it's their first time today? Wow, congratulations. Um, well, here's how this is gonna go. So we record this as a podcast and a vlog so that you guys can, um, can take this home with you after, afterwards. Um, so we do this, we, I, I ask five questions, okay? Five questions and after that, we pull the plug. And you guys are free to ask anything that you can think of, of sales, marketing, sales leadership, and so on. You have a global sales leader who has walked the walk, so please do, your, do yourselves a favor and, and ask it. If you have a question, ask it. There is no judgment, that's our only rule, um, so ask away, all right? Before we get into that, though, I wanna make sure that we thank some people. If you are at home or on, the, on your treadmill listening to this right now, or you're watching on your laptop, this is not voodoo, it is not magic. It's Jensen Studios, so Jake and Eric, thank you guys so much for all that you guys do. Put your hands together for these guys. <laughs> if you're just waking up or rolling out of bed, uh, Driven Coffee is over here to uh, fill your head full of delicious caffeine. Thank you guys for, sh for coming here uh, month after month and, and pouring the good stuff. And then WeWork, thank you guys for everything that you do. This has been fun, thanks for having us back. All right, last but not least, my name is Michael Abador. For those that I haven't met, um, I'm the host and creator of Coffee and Closers, but when I'm not here, we run a revenue growth agency with a fantastic team called the Bedore Business Group. And what we do is we uh, help uh, startups to establish brands grow revenue by sales, branding, or, uh, or training. So if any of that sounds interesting, come see us afterwards or uh, check us out on BedoreBusinessGroup.com. We have a brand new, shh, you guys are the first to know website. Thanks to Adholics, Josh Feedy over there, did great work. We're gonna be doing a little party and celebration to roll that out soon. So check it out. With what we do, we get a chance to collaborate and become friends with some of the top minds in, in sales. And Corey Storkamp is absolutely no exception. Uh, when he was an individual producer, he was a four times, four, uh, sorry, four time President's Club Award winner. For those of you not in sales and don't know what that means, that means that you are in, in tech sales anyway, that means you're ranked in the top one to 3% of all of your peers. And what's most impressive about that is that he did that at, at two uh, tech behemoths, Epicor and Oracle. He was ranked in the top one to 3% against 75 to 100,000 other sales reps. So when you're in that position, what would you do? Well, I know what I would not do, and that's going to management. That's exactly what he did. <laughs> and he had, even more success there. He led, uh, he led a double-digit growth uh, at Oracle here in the Twin Cities office, as well as in the Bay. And then uh, he got snatched up by Microsoft to be one of their most prolific uh, global sales directors. So we're honored to have him here. Put your hands together for Mr. Corey Storkamp. Hi, bud. Thanks for coming, man. Oh, well, that's where you put it. Yeah. <laughs> well. Help us fill in the blanks here. What, what don't we know about Corey Storkamp? Oh, no, it's such, I mean, great introduction. Thank you. An honor to be here. Uh, I, I was joking earlier that I'm probably one of the only guests who doesn't drink coffee at Coffee and Closers. Um, never had a full cup of coffee in my life, so here I am with my water here. But uh, pleasure to be here anyway. Yes, uh, the fill in the blanks, I think you did a good job of embarrassing me a little bit, so I appreciate that. It's part um, of the gig. Listen, my whole entire career has been in sales, specifically in, in tech sales and um, actually more specifically in inside tech sales. And so, as Mick said, I've, I've been at Epicor Software here in Minneapolis, I've been at Oracle here in Minneapolis, Oracle in the Bay Area, and now I've been with Microsoft the last couple of years running a, a global sales organization. So, that high level, that's, uh, you know, fill in the blanks. What does a global sales director do? Because it sounds important, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like he, just, <laughs> he travels around with Pitbull yeah. and, you know. I, uh, yeah, me, me and Pitbull, Mr. Worldwide, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of delegation. No, just kidding. Uh, so a little bit more about what I do. I actually, this is my first venture into sort of a, a post-sales motion. And so my entire career, I've been on the pre-sales side. Um, new business, existing business, working with um, net new logos or existing customers. 
And now this is um, after they buy our software, um, specifically Microsoft Azure, my team goes in as customer success reps. Uh, they go in and actually um, help land the software, they help implement, they help onboard, they help um, adoption and consumption and, and driving to other workloads within the Azure suite as well. So it's a little bit new venture for me. So um, I do have five sites globally. The US site happens to be in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, a little story behind that. but. Uh, so Fargo, Dublin, uh, Sydney, Australia, um, San Jose, Costa Rica, and then we have a small office in India as well. Wonderful. So just before we get into this, what do you guys want to learn today? Because I, I saw a lot of hands go up this first time, but there's sales people, so individual sales performers. There's also some leaders in the group. How many leaders do we have? All right, sales people? All right. So um, this guy, I know that it's been a while since you've been in the field, but um, this is an individual that I, I have not seen this happen a lot. I failed, so I, I tried to be a leader and I sucked at it because I was too selfish and I wanted to make too much money. So um, I wasn't good at that. So I'm always envious of somebody who has both skills because it happens, I mean, once in a blue moon, right? So could you talk a little bit about your, your maybe your transition from you know, sales performer to, to leadership, that calling and... Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and it really was a calling because I, I don't think I was quite ready to let go of the individual contributor role. At the time, we were kind of building out a new team at Oracle is specific to um, healthcare applications or HCM, human capital management. And so here I was, I was, um, I was going on I think my fourth year as an individual contributor, and I was approached um, by someone who um, I've worked for for a number of years, and he asked me, he's like, hey, I think you should consider being a manager. And I said, gosh, I don't know about that. I, you know, I, I like, kind of liked my own little world. I like my own territory. I like my own customers. I'd working with my same customers for three or four years. And so he approached me and said, listen, you're kind of doing it anyway. Like, everyone comes to you for a lot of things and asks you a lot of questions already. So I think you should seriously consider it. And so I, you know, did some soul searching and I said, all right, I'll, I'll try it out and see what happens. And, and mostly because of the potential. It was a brand new um, organization within Oracle. And so I knew that it had the potential to grow. Um, I didn't know it was going to bring me to the Bay Area for a couple of years. But that was just, a, I guess, an added benefit of it all. So yeah, I guess it was just a, it was just a calling, I guess. Um, and I don't know if I was ready for it or not, but I jumped in with both feet. I went from managing a team of 10 or 12 to uh, becoming a director of, uh, I think, close to 60 or 70 out in the Bay Area. So it, 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 you know, it, it grew rapidly and my career kind of accelerated from there. So it was a great opportunity. I promised five questions, but I lied. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to circle yeah, back that, to your build. I think we're on three. So yeah, yeah. Two. No one's counting. <laughs> um, I want to get back to the Bay Area build because I know that was super challenging and super uh, impressive what you were able to do. And I want to talk to you about the demeanor and why that was challenging, if that's OK. Yeah. But we do have a couple questions. Failure, like you've had a lot of success. You wouldn't be here if you hadn't, right? And we all want to learn about your success, but I don't know about you guys, I learned the most from somebody's failure and how they get back up. Has anyone here ever failed? Oh, five, see five hands down. Congratulations, you're a liar. <laughs> um, let's hear about a time maybe that you, you, you accepted a challenge, it didn't go as planned, you, you bombed, and what you learned from it. Yeah, I mean, failures on a daily basis, right? I mean, and you're right, you learn the most from those failures. I think, um, Going back to my first year as a seller, I started at Epicor in business development and then was promoted into sort of an inside and outside um, sales role, selling ERP, manufacturing software. And the first year I didn't hit my number. And I thought, gosh, you know, I, I did really well at this whole business development thing and um, I'm gonna get into like, carrying a bag and having a quota and I failed, right? I, I think I was at like 80% of my number that year. And I, I didn't realize how much hard work it took to actually get to the number and, and really how much pipeline you needed to build in order to get to the number. Um, and at the end of the day, over years and years, um, I, I've always gone by you know, three to four times pipeline, right? You win a deal, you lose a deal, and one deal pushes. So about 3x pipeline. Um, that was more in the, the on-premise world. Now in the SaaS world, you, you probably have to have a little bit more than that. But um, I didn't realize that it took that much pipeline build and, and that many deals to get me to the, the end goal, to get me to my number. And then also, getting into the accounts, I thought, oh, I have my main contact here. He's, here's the IT manager, here's the IT director, and I'm good because what they're telling me, it speaks on behalf of everybody. Mm -mm, uh. Absolutely not, right? You have multiple stakeholders in every single deal, and you have to 
you have to know who's the influencer, you have to know who's the decision maker, and all the different types within a, an entire sales cycle. And I just, I was so um, narrow-minded at the time, the first, first real year in sales, and I failed. But I learned a ton from it, and from then on out, it's always, always be prospecting. Always have a good, solid, healthy pipeline. Not only in, in, in deals, but also when we, when we started building out sales organizations, always, always have a bench of candidates and pipeline to build for your, your future turnover. Thank you for that. And I want to break for a second. Um, how many generator, what's the, the, the summer class, generator summer class, how many folks do we have? Yeah, I saw you guys coming in. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know, generator is a fantastic incubator. These are, these are startups, I think a thousand apply, what, 1% get selected and they, they come to the Twin Cities. It's led by my friend, Eric Mattel. It's a great group. But this is something to take note of for you guys. And this is, I'm, I've, I don't know how many, what's the third company that we started? I'll tell you right now, that is, and it's, it's the hardest when it's yours. So when you're selling for somebody else, like an Oracle or Epicor, that happens. But it hurts the most when it's your company. Because, right, Paul? You've invented a couple, you started a couple of companies. You, you're, it's a weird passionate about, a, sorry, you're, you're weirdly passionate about it because it's your baby. And so all the things, even if you're professionally trained like, like we are, you just you skip past those steps and you, you, you go, oh, I've got a buyer, I see, I see a buyer sign. We've got a relationship because you're, you're attached to your baby. They may or may not be. So anyway, that was really wise, wise, wise well, advice because we've, we've all been there and it really hurts when it's your company or your baby. I mean, it hurts not hitting quota, but it really hurts when it's your project that you know, they don't say yes to and you, you thought you had one. Yeah. Um, so what did you learn from that? And let's kind of maybe roll into some successes where that failure kind of applied and, and you grew from it. Yeah, it was, so I, I kind of mentioned a few things that I, I learned from it about pipeline build and always always be prospecting, always have a bench of candidates if you're building out a sales organization. Um, if, if we transition into some of the successes, I think there's a common theme of taking on the hard stuff and taking on challenges and going outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. That's where I've um, learned the most. That's when I've been the most challenged. That's when I've grown the most. Um, and so things like having to build out a sales team, not only here in, in Minneapolis, but moving to the Bay Area, right? Moving halfway across the country, you know, 2,000 miles away, um, doing a long distance relationship at the time, you know, moving to a city where I've, I've, I traveled to a few times, but I didn't really know, and um, getting into a market that's highly, highly competitive in the tech space. So you're hiring on people, you're training them up for six months, and then all of a sudden, they put on their resume that they worked for Oracle and it's a golden ticket in the Bay Area and they can go to any one of 10 other software companies or startups, right? So um, that was, you know, that's, that's pretty challenging to, to deal with. But I think the challenges that I've taken on, you know, whether it's the, the move to the Bay Area or coming over to Microsoft a couple of years ago and having to go, I was up in Fargo every week for a, about a year and a half, Monday through Thursday, going up and doing that kind of long distance again. I think those things that I took on as challenges helped me um, grow the most, helped me learn the most, um, and ultimately it kind of put me in where I am today. So would you mind sharing some, so, uh, some easy for me to say, right? Uh, some specifics, there we go. That was, that was my, over, I overcame a challenge there, if you guys witnessed that. <laughs> Everybody's growing today. Um, how about the Bay Area to the Fargo thing, the demeanor of folks, the challenges? I mean, because you talk, we talked at length about it at the time, you know, mm -hmm. just about building this team and building the right team. And, you know, I, we've had some hands raised when, you know, leadership folks today, probably future salespeople that will become leaders. How do you, how have you built teams so successfully, so consistently for so long? What's your I, process? I don't think there's any secret formula, but I, th I think, um, and we talked about this on your podcast, actually, about building out sales organizations. And I, you know, my theme of that podcast was um, don't sacrifice for some of the talent that you bring on board. Know your, know your talent profile, know kind of um, those characteristics of that, of that, um, that role and, um, and, 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 and don't vary from that, right? And always stick to, well, my gut doesn't feel right about this particular person. It may take you a little bit longer to hire that person initially, but in the long term it pays off, right? Because that person, may not work out and then, and then having to sort of um, part ways with somebody, especially in a large organization, can take a long, long time. And so just know the ideal kind of candidate profile and stick to that. And then, um, you know, really kind of help surround yourself with people that um, can help you get that job done and, and that are as passionate about it as you are, right? And so I, I've been a part of organizations and build outs where they hire the, the individual contributor population first. And then I've also been a part of them where they hire the leadership first. 
And I just, I don't know, in my opinion, you, you have to hire the leadership first because they're building their own teams and they may have a certain style, they may have a certain candidate that they're looking for or maybe building out a team in, a, in, in their own way. And so, I don't know, I, I've, I've come into a role before where the, the, the individual contributor population is already built out and it just, it's a little more challenging to step into that type of a leadership role versus actually being there first and having built it out yourself. So, that's interesting. Well, you, you parallel with, with with athletic teams too, and to go from different, you know, whether it's NHL, NBA, NFL, you've seen kind of the systems that have coach first, and then they build their team out, and the longevity of that of that formula, and then some teams where great players hop on, and you see that kind of implode. Yeah. Huh. So you see more consistently where hire the manager and have that manager build out their ideal. Yeah, listen, I think it's, it can be harder to find those types of leaders. You know, if it's, for me at the time, they were looking for a, someone who had inside sales leadership experience that was willing to, first, willing to relocate to Fargo, you know? And so it, it's, it's a little bit challenging, right? And so sometimes finding the, leaderships can, finding the leaders can be a little bit harder than finding the individual contributors, especially in that environment where, you know, I think they, they they didn't have as difficult time finding some of the, the individual contributor population in that area with some of the local universities, relocating people. I think we relocated, relocated from 20 different cities across the country to Fargo. And so, um, you know, it can be a little bit more challenging finding the leadership. So, um, but I, I, I don't know, in my opinion, I think you start there and then they can build out their teams themselves and they can be held accountable for the people that they hire. For those aspiring, you know, salespeople that don't want to admit it, but you want to be a manager. I mean, is there anybody here that, uh, well, I won't call you out, but, you know, there's some folks that, that are called to that. You know you got to do this sales gig for a while, right? I mean, there's, you're amongst us. Um, how do you, I'm not calling anyone out, but how do you identify that future leader, right? Like, you're looking at your sales performers and you're like, that person has it. What do they have? Ooh, you know, I think it's kind of that, what I, what I spoke to before where the, the individual who hired me on as a manager was like, well, you're already, you're already kind of doing it. There's already sort of that, I don't want to say that it factor because that's a little bit ambiguous, but you're already contributing at a much higher level. Yes, you are hitting your numbers. Yes, you have the pipeline built out, but you're, you're going above and beyond, taking on some stretch projects, becoming a part of other, other organizations within the company going outside kind of your comfort zone and you are you kind of just you see some of these people rise to the top in leadership positions some are more obvious than others um, some of them come to you and say hey I want to be in in leadership and management and others you just sort of kind of keep your eye on and go wow this person keeps on stepping up to the plate when asked to do something above and beyond their normal job scope and uh, you just you, you kind of keep an eye on that um, but uh, again others will just come flat out and say hey I I want this, this is my next role, which I appreciate because I can't tell you how many times that I've promoted someone from an, from an individual contributor into a management role just to have someone else go, hey, but what about me? I wanna, I wanna be in management. And I'm like, well, I didn't know that and, and or your manager didn't know that. So it, that's half the battle is just letting people know your intentions and your career path. I know it sounds so simple, but just letting people know your, your, your intention is to explore this, even if it's, Maybe it's you're, you're trying to decide between going from inside sales to outside sales versus inside sales to management and you're kind of exploring both. Just let your, your frontline manager know that. Um, know that that's your intention because it's, it's half the battle. Well, and, and to, to add on that, I mean, anybody here that's maybe considering leaving their current position, right? To make others make it well known. I think it's okay, it's 2018 to just say, you know, maybe I, over here I would be more successful, right? I mean, we've got some recruiters in, in the house Maybe, maybe you guys exploit that sometimes. Maybe you, not exploit, but maybe you, you draw that out of some people to say, I'm an individual performer, and yes, I'm doing well, but my heart says management. Right, yep. All right. It, so about for the non-sales people, because this is, we, we started Coffee and Clothes originally, it's morphed into something more, but um, for non-sales people, and we saw those hands raise up, so there's a lot of sales people, so this is our market, so we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep talking to you guys, but originally we started for non-sales non people to wanna dispel that all salespeople were liars, cheaters, sold insurance or cars or whatever, and uh, no offense to the people that do that, um, but you know, and that we're all the same, you know, we're all here to, to jam whatever it is down your throat. Uh, what could you, for those people, how do you dispel yeah. th that about sales? Yeah, so that, it's true, right? Everyone is supposedly an A-type personality, is loud, is pushy, is, 
you know, listen to all that. I, I don't know. I, I think I, I might be living proof of the, almost the opposite because I'm a lot more introverted and a lot more analytical than most. Um, I'm, I'm a verifier. Like, I, I process data for a long time versus just, um, just outwardly speak what's on my mind at that moment. And so I, I don't know. I, I think it's been a refreshing approach to the customers that I've dealt with because they are used to those type A personalities. They are used to like, hey, this deal expires at the end of the month, which is the end of my quarter, and how can we incent you to get this deal over the line? I don't know. I, I take a little bit more of an analytical approach to it and um, become sort of a, I don't know, overused term, but trusted advisor to the customers. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I guess by nature of who I am and, and my temperament, I just, I just listen more. I, um, I tend not to want to jump in and speak and say, here's my features and benefits and you know, talk at them. Um, I, you need to listen. That's why you have one of these and two of these, right? Oh, snap. <laughs> Did you just invent that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fun. We, we, I, I, I want to ask that question because I want this to hammer home for any first time listener or any first time attendee about the true salespeople are people that actually A, care, you know, are more provi are advisors than providers, right? And people have a process, and generally it's just clear communication. It's nothing more. It's just concise communication, nothing more, where it's a dialogue. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you bet. So last but not least, and I know you guys are, are probably Jones and ask some, some questions, but um, I want to kind of know a little bit. You, you've been around a while. You've done your thing. You've, you've been through trainings. You've led trainings. You've hired probably trainers. Is there any training that people can go, like tangible information that they can take away today saying, Go to this site. Here's here's a here's training that we've 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 really uh, found value in. Here's podcasts I find value in, books I've read, so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, besides hiring the Bedore Business Group, you mean? Uh, besides that, <laughs> but that, you're right. That's yeah. kind of the, that's kind of the stuff also. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, my my <laughs> tips and tricks and my bag of goodies. I, you know, I don't know. We we've adopted the Challenger Sale at Microsoft. I think that's a fantastic sales yeah. kind of methodology book. Um, you know, creating positive tension with customers. A lot of people are afraid to do that, and I think that's super important in the sales cycle. So I think in terms of sales, um, that would be my, my go-to is the challenger sale. And then, I don't know, I love this book called The Energy, the Energy Bus by John Gordon. It's, it, it's such a simple book. It almost reads like a children's book, and you're gonna read it and go, this is Corey, what was he talking about? But it's all about positive attitude and um, the decisions that you make and finding silver linings and things and different ways to look at things. It's a, it's a very simple story about a guy who gets on a bus every day because his car broke down. And again, you're gonna read it and go, is this a children's book? Um, but it's a, it's a great read. I gave it to all of my, um, my management staff in my last leadership offsite. And I don't know, I think it just goes to the fact that 90% of everything is attitude, right? And uh, having a positive attitude in, in life and in, in a sales role uh, can make all the difference. Um, and then, and for fun, I think um, in terms of like bag of bag of tricks, uh, Tim Ferriss, anything Tim Ferriss, love his podcast. Yeah. Um, Dr. Michael Gervais, he's somebody that we use a lot at, at Microsoft. He actually started a company with Pete Carroll, the head coach really? of the Seahawks, and it's called Compete to Create. And he um, he does a fantastic job of um, coaching people on how to develop a personal philosophy for their life as a sort of a a template and a, and a north star for decision making in your life, and so that for me is um, has created a lot of a lot of purpose. What's so, it called? Um, well, the company that they create is called Compete to Create, but his name is Dr. Michael Gervais. I will check that out. I yeah, heard last year. yeah, he may have. I think Tim Ferriss actually had him on one of his podcasts, to be honest. But um, just really fascinating stuff about finding purpose and, and meaning in your life. So, um, yeah, those would be my my go tos. Fantastic. Well, I'm done being selfish, and I'm going to dispel the myth. Everyone's wondering if you're the fourth Jonas brother. Um, <laughs> he is not. I don't know if those guys are still around, if that's relevant, but man, that was fun when we used to tell people you were a Jonas. Yeah, we got away with a lot. Didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. You guys put your hands together for Corey Sturkin. All right, so what do we think? What'd you learn? Well, if you like that, check out coffeeposers.com for upcoming episodes, recordings, and more. And don't forget to check out our sponsors. Each one has been hand-selected. They are best in class. Until next time, we'll see you at the next Coffee and Closers. Cheers. Say live, come on live. Live a life we love. Gotta live, I said live. Live a life we love.